The spinal cord is exactly like an elevator, sending information up to the brain about what we're feeling and then carrying information down from the brain to make motor output. So it's basically either traveling up or down and out. Now, in order to understand how the spinal cord does that, we have to look at the anatomy of it. So what I've done here is I've taken a cross section of the spinal cord, basically cutting myself in half, top to bottom, and then we're going to peek inside and this is what we will see inside the spinal cord. So we know that this side, this aspect of the spinal cord, will be the dorsal side or the posterior back side. And then this side will be the ventral or anterior front side. So everything we name will deal with, whether it's in the front or in the back. So we're going to work first from inside out. We're going to talk about the actual tissue of the spinal cord, the nerves, and then we're going to talk about the meninges on the outside, the layers wrapping around the spinal cord. So let's get started. So first off, in the center, we have an aptly named central canal. So I'm going to label that central canal. Now this central canal is going to contain some cerebrospinal fluid. It's basically lubrication with some salts, electrolytes, water, and it's going to lubricate the inside of the spinal cord, and it's actually consistent all the way up to the ventricles of the brain. So that way we lubricate the spinal cord, nourish it, as well as the brain in those ventricles up top. Now, then we see kind of two main sections. We kind of have this white section of the spinal cord and then this dotted section. It's actually going to be gray in your textbooks. So I'm going to label this section as the gray matter. And then I'm going to label this out section as the white matter. Now, why is that gray and white? Well, the gray is basically going to consist of many, many, many interneurons, close connectors, and they're going to be communicating and processing information here. Whereas in the white matter, we're going to have neurons axons, the signaling branch of the neurons, that are going to be myelinated. So that means they are insulated with myelin and they're going to send long distance signals. So whenever we put a neuron's axon into the white matter, it's going to be sending information way up to the brain or way down from the brain. Whereas in the gray matter, this is where we're processing. So a lot of neurons uh, talking back and forth about each other and seeing what's going on. So knowing that we have the gray matter, we have four main sections of the gray matter. And I'm going to kind of designate them like this. So we've got this posterior section, kind of got this middle section here, and then this front section. And all of these are going to have the word horn after it because they have that little pointed end to it. So as you could probably guess, the back side is going to be called the dorsal horn of the gray matter, dorsal horn. That means that the front side will likely be called the ventral horn of the gray matter. And then this middle one, instead of being like the medial horn, you see that it's more on the outside. So we call this the lateral horn of the gray matter. Okay. And again, processing, processing information. Now in the white matter, all of the names we're going to call them funiculi or funiculus. So I'm going to section this out the back side here and then the middle section, and then the front section. Okay, why these sections? So we've got here, here, and here, because this is going to be the, as you can guess, dorsal funiculus, ventral funiculus, and then you could probably guess funiculus, lateral funiculus, lateral funiculus. Okay. Now, weird, weird sounding name funiculus or funiculi, right? Well, funiculus just means cord-like structure. So cord-like. And this is really well named because, like I said, there's going to be long myelinated axons here. And if you look at those myelinated axons, they literally look like cords, okay? Now, one other thing I want to mention, these funiculi can also be called columns. You might hear these called columns because, again, they're like columns of white matter sending long distance signals up and down. Wonderful. Now, as we can see, we've got equal and opposite gray and white matter on both sides. And then we've got this connection between the gray matter that we call the gray commissure. Okay, gray commissure. And why is it called commissure? Well, if you commiserate with somebody, you come together and talk about something that's going on, right? So this is actually where the gray matter is going to connect, combine together. 
Now, as we're working our way outside, we see there are two involutions of the spinal cord here, yes? Now, we call these a sulcus, a dorsal sulcus, dorsal sulcus, literally meaning small inward depression right here. And then we've got the ventral, but then we call this ventral fissure, which means very big involution, right? So here's the ventral fissure and then the dorsal sulcus. Wonderful. Okay, now we know what the inside of the spinal cord contains, but let's look at these roots here, right? So this orange section are going to be the spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves, I'm going to bundle here. This is a spinal nerve. And a spinal nerve basically just contains axons of both sensory and motor neurons. What does that mean? Well, we know that we will have, and I'll show it in the next video, motor neurons chilling here in the ventral horn of the gray matter, and they're gonna send their signals down and out, and it's all going to be motor information, like talking to a skeletal muscle to contract it. But then we'll also have sensory information coming in all the way back into the dorsal horn, okay? So this is going to be sensory information. Let's label that as S, label this as M. So we call these the ventral roots, and the dorsal roots of the spinal nerve. So dorsal root of spinal nerve, and we have ventral root of the spinal nerve as well. And as we can see, the ventral side has motor information, dorsal side has sensory information. Now, we'll also have these tiny little connections and projections going basically out and in here, and we call these rootlets because they're tiny, okay? So rootlets here, we also have rootlets there. Now, one other thing within the spinal nerves is we're going to have little bumps on the dorsal aspect, little bumps on the dorsal aspect. And this is called the dorsal root ganglion. Dorsal root ganglion. Dorsal root, right? Because we're on the dorsal side of the spinal nerve. And then we've got ganglion. And ganglion is just basically a collection of cell bodies. Now, if you were to guess what cell bodies or what type of neuron cell bodies will these be? Well, we know that this is carrying sensory information to the spinal cord. So these are going to be all sensory neurons housed here. So the sensory neuron cell bodies are housed up in the dorsal root ganglion. So we'll talk a little more about how those interact in a later video. Let's keep moving on through this anatomy. So now we've gone out of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. Now what we get to talk about are the meninges, the meninges. Meninge just means layer. So go ahead and write some more meninges. And this just means layer or wrapping, okay? So it's some sort of wrapping layer around the spinal cord. And now this is where I'm going to flip it a little bit. And I'm actually going to work outside in, in terms of the wrappings. Why am I doing that? Well, let me show you. On the outside, we're going to have a green meninge called the dura matter. We'll talk about that in a second. The second meninge as we work in is going to be called the arachnoid matter, arachnoid. And then the last one is going to be called the pia matter. I did that in purple, P. Here's the pia matter. Now, why am I going from outside in when I'm labeling these? Because I always remember a spinal dap, right? Have you ever heard of a spinal tap before where you have to like get a needle inserted into your back, test for meningitis? Well, I remember dap, D-A-P, because we can also think of outside in, that is the spinal cord layers. You can also think of it, if you'd like to, from inside out, it's going to be a pad for your spinal cord. So whatever way you want to remember it, either outside in or inside out, works for me. Now, I said a word after all of these, and that is the word matter or mater. You might hear either one. That, again, just means it's a layer, a meninge of the spinal cord. Now, what do they do and what are these spaces in between? Because we see the layer and then we see a space. Okay, so let's start first with the dura matter. Now, if you think of the word dura, what word comes to mind? Dura bull, right? And I want you to remember that the dura matter is very durable, okay? It's very strong and protective. In fact, the dura matter will wrap around these spinal nerves on both sides to help protect them, as well as protect the, the entire spinal cord as a whole. 
Now, with the dura, you may have heard of something called an epidural before. Have you heard of an epidural? Well, an epidural is an injection you get if you're giving birth. Um, it can also be for um, curing some spinal pain. But we'll say when you're giving birth, you get an epidural. You get an injection of a spinal block medication epidurally. What does that mean? Well, we know that epidural means on top of the dura. So what's interesting is the epidural space is all right here. This is the epidural space. And it contains primarily adipose tissue. Okay, so the epidural space is again ad adipose tissue, so it's padding the spinal cord a little bit, so it's a little bit of protective agent. Now, I mentioned that epidural, that injection actually comes right into here, and then they're going to actually release that spinal block right here. It will actually diffuse throughout the spinal cord, block all of the nerves, we'll talk about it in a second, and therefore you don't feel anything from uh, waist down, and you can't move anything from waist down either. It's like you're breaking down that elevator at that point, at that level. So we'll talk about that in a second. So we've got the epidural space, fat tissue, some blood vessels. We've got the dura matter, durable layer protecting the spinal cord. Now we're working inwardly, and we're going to have a space called the subdural space right below it. So subdural space. Not a whole lot to say here, but there is going to be some serous fluid. So remember, subdural space, serous. And we know that is a type of lubricant. Okay, it's the same type of uh, fluid that's actually lining your pleura, so your um, lining of your lungs, as well as your pericardium, lining of your heart, and it always prevents friction. So that these spaces, these meninges, can like glide across each other with virtually a frictionless environment. Very important. Okay, now as we move inward, we have the blue matter, which is going to be the arachnoid matter. Now, the arachnoid matter was named that because it kind of sounds like the word arachnid, which means wispy, like a spider web, right? So that is a very wispy layer. But what I want you to remember is the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid space. And this is going to contain cerebrospinal fluid again. Where have we seen that before? Cerebrospinal fluid? Inside the central canal. So all throughout the subarachnoid space, I'm just going to color this in a little bit, we're going to have a lot of serous fluid, or sorry, not serous fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, why is that cerebrospinal fluid so important? Well, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is going to allow for that lubrication once again, as well as some nourishment of the spinal cord. It's going to provide some nutrients, uh, some salts to the spinal cord cells, the neurons, so that they can function properly. Now, when you get that spinal block, like I mentioned earlier, it will actually diffuse into the subarachnoid space. And this is important because then it's going to allow itself to get into those spinal nerves and thus block off signals both for sensory information and motor output. That is how those spinal blocks work. Very, very interesting. Uh, you can also get a spinal block uh, if you have like nerve pain. And what it does is there's a pain medication injected in there, diffuses through, and it numbs that pain pretty darn well. Okay, so that's the subarachnoid space, got the CSF, and then we finally have the pia matter, and I drew that in purple. So the pia matter, or pia matter, some people say it differently, pia matter, pia matter. All I want you to know is it's going to be like the saran wrap of the spinal cord. So saran wrap of spinal cord and also your brain. It is the one that's going to basically hold it tightly. So think about you've got literally millions of neurons coming in, going up. You want to keep them in the proper space, right? You want to keep them not like bent over here and there. You want to keep them tight and packed. So if you were to want to send a package, say, to Amazon uh, and get it shipped to your family or whatever, what will you do to your valuables? Well, you're likely going to saran wrap them or bubble wrap them really well before you ship them off. Same thing with your spinal cord. The pia matter is going to really saran wrap it tight, keep it stable so that the structural integrity stays the same. Therefore, the functional integrity stays the same. Now, the pia matter is the only one that actually connects to the spinal cord itself. 
The uh, rachnoid and the dura mater actually wrap a little bit around those spinal nerves, so it's a little more extended. Now, last thing with the pia mater, it also forms eventually a connection down to the coccyx and sacrum called the phylum terminale, and that's actually going to connect the spinal cord all the way to the base of your sacrum because the spinal cord actually ends at L2 or so, lumbar 2 vertebrae, but then this pia mater is going to stabilize it all the way down to your coccyx, so all the nerves running down through like L3, uh, S1, all that stuff are going to be nice and firm and connected as well. So that is the spinal cord anatomy. Be sure to check out this video to figure out reflex uh, physiology as well as just the function of the spinal cord as a whole.